Ah. Um, <clears throat> I took this invitation quite literally. I was asked to come and have a conversation and tell a story. So I said, oh, well then, can I sit down? Sure. Can I wear whatever I want? Sure. So I'm sitting down, wearing what I want, and I'm going to read you a story. Um, and I want you to forgive me for reading this, but it's for your own good. If left to my own timing, we would be here for weeks. <laughs> I suffer from STTSD, or NSTTSD, not sticking to the story disorder. <laughs> I haven't spoken publicly about this part of my life, so I need all of you to send me as much energy as you can spare so that I can get through this. My pockets are filled with good luck charms and talismans to also help me get through this. My name is Paul Chudy. I've lived in the same city, Washington, D.C., for the past 25 years. I've worked at George Washington University for the past 21 years. I've lived in the same house for the past 18 years, and though it is a long distance one, I am grateful to say that I've been in the same relationship for 21 years. I'm a Vietnam veteran. Nothing could have prepared me for what I was to experience. I was about to be tested. My morals, my values, my body, and my soul were all going to be at risk. I had been taught never to hurt another living being. On November 14, 1967, I received my draft notice. I was young, innocent, naive, and clueless, and was taught to do whatever I was told. During basic training, I began to put it together that what we were being trained for was to win a war, to kill people, to learn to be aggressive. My soul was not prepared for this because I cannot kill. It became obvious that I had no choice though, so I took action. I plunged my hands in boiling water. It worked. I was willing to do anything that the Army had asked me to because I love my country, but I just could not kill. I completed basic training <clears throat> with bandaged hands and was excused from having to carry a weapon or fire one. I trained to be a medic. On March 28, 1969, I was sent to Vietnam. My soul, again, was filled with terror and it did not have a place to express itself. For the next 15 months, I saw the horrors of war. My buddies and I saw death, mutilation, suffering, and covered with blood, we worked hour upon hour, trying our best to save lives, both American and Vietnamese. We worked for hours, <clears throat> and tending to the men who had been blown apart and who looked just like us. My soul was starving, desperate. But through all of this horror, there were times of peace. The extremes of human nature respect, and then contempt, compassion, and then cruelty, love, and then hate, the sacred, and then the profane, suffering to comforting, 
all within the blink of an eye. Was not a good place for souls to thrive or even survive. So on a whim, my two hooch mates and I decided to paint our hooch bright yellow. We created a place to kick back and to dream, to rest, to laugh, to listen to music. The only bit of light in a sea of olive drab buildings. It became a gathering place, a beacon for other GIs who happened to be passing through. People would drop in, I'd come back, there'd be people laying on the floor in the hooch that I had never seen before, but who thanked us profusely for a chance to just rest. It became a lunchroom for the local Vietnamese women who worked on our compound. It was a place of love, a place of music, kind of a Woodstock in Phu Bai, Vietnam. There were friendships and dream making. A close knit family was formed. A closeness with my buddies that I had never experienced before in my life. But each day of the horror left us with less, with larger gaps in our souls. The yellow hooch could only sustain us. It could not rebuild us. Over time, my buddies rotated home. I was left alone. The friendships that sustained me departed, and a piece of my soul departed with each of them. One day in May of 1970, I ran to the chopper, the medic chopper that just landed, to unload yet another wounded soldier, a blonde, 19-year-old from Texas. We pulled him into the operating room and the medical team worked furiously to save his beautiful life. The noise of the machines, the instruments, the shouts for more blood were deafening. And then silence. It was over. He was dead. Everyone left the room. The doctor said, Shooty, you finish up here. I was left alone with his lifeless body. I had had enough. I screamed to the heavens with a sound that I could never imagine myself coming from me. And then it happened. My soul vanished. It left my body, it escaped, I was empty. My last weeks in Vietnam were a blur. I was ordered not to return to the ER or the surgical suites. I retreated to the safety of the yellow hooch. I left Vietnam on June 22nd, 1970. I wept as the jeep pulled away from the yellow hooch. I was numb and soulless. My arrival home was not a celebration for me. I actually called a friend from the airport when I landed in Dayton, Ohio, to come and pick me up so that we could drive around for a few hours because I was not ready to return to the home where I was raised. I was a stranger in a strange land. I spent the next 14 years wandering and doing good, clearing my head, coaxing my soul to return. I became a hunter-gatherer. My parents would say I even looked like a hunter-gatherer. I changed a lot, and by the way, I'm the one on your right. <laughs> I had to rebuild my identity by again discovering that there's really good 
in the world. I had many teachers as I wandered around the globe, most of whom were just common folks. Over the 14 years, I lived in 10 different places, had 11 different jobs, sometimes two and three at a time. I had six significant relationships and many affairs. I had traveled to 17 different countries, gathering up pieces of my soul. No one could stop me from doing good. And finally, finally, my soul felt safe enough to return to me. I suppose that the lesson in this story is that we're all survivors. Whether you're a soldier returning from war, whether you're grieving the loss of a loved one, or are, or are a survivor of any of life's tragic moments. Your soul can be cured. It can be coaxed back. Your wounds will heal. You can be soothed, and life can be good. We can build a future. We are enhanced and not damaged by our experiences. It's all in the seeking, the gathering, the doing good. It takes time to rebuild a safe place for your soul to dwell. A yellow hooch, maybe, filled with people who love and nurture you and who, can who you can love in return. I am who I am today because of my experience in Vietnam. My buddies, the realization that I'm a brave person and that my sense of self-preservation is strong. And it's the yellow hooch and the people in my life now who have healed me. I would not trade my experience for anything, but I would not wish it on anyone. I would like to close by reading you a poem. It is found written on the wall of Mother Teresa's hospice in Calcutta. The original author's name is Kent Keith. The Anyway Poem. People are often unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some false friends and some enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and frank, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight. Build anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, they may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give the world the best you have anyway. For you see, in the final analysis, it is between you and your God. It was never between you and them anyway. Thank you.